Welcome to the forum at the Harvard School of Public Health. My name is Lance Gould, and I'm the Executive Special Projects Editor at the Huffington Post, and I'm today's moderator. April is National Distracted Driving Awareness Month, and in honor of that effort, we're here to talk about how we can save lives through preventing distracted driving. Today's event is a collaboration of the Forum and the Huffington Post. The Forum is a live webcasting series about health policy produced at the Harvard School of Public Health, which is celebrating its centennial this year. We are live tweeting at Forum HSPH. If you'd like to join the conversation on Twitter, you may also email questions for our panelists now to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. Today, we will first hear from Julio Frank, Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, for some opening remarks. Then the Honorable Anthony Fox, U.S. Secretary of Transportation, will address the audience and will join me and Jay Winston, uh, Associate Dean for Health Communication at the Harvard School of Public Health, for a conversation. We'll also be showing clips from the Department of Transportation's Faces of Distracted Driving series. Dean Frank. Thank you, Lance, and good morning to everyone. On behalf of the Harvard School of Public Health, I'd like to welcome our studio audience as well as the many viewers online uh, who are watching us live on the web websites of the Forum, the Huffington Post, and the U.S. Department of Transportation. We are truly privileged uh, to have with us the Honorable Anthony Fox, the 17th United States Secretary of Transportation. Secretary Fox's uh, official biography says that his primary goal is to ensure that America maintains the safest, most efficient transportation system in the world. And that mission is why he is here, to draw public awareness to a dangerously underappreciated safety risk, distracted driving. A result of our technological age, distracted driving is pernicious and have no doubt that it is a clearly identifiable public health problem. Hundreds of thousands of drivers are injured annually in motor vehicle crashes involving a distracted driver. Today, you will hear about the scope of the problem, and in the tradition of the forum at Harvard School of Public Health, you will also hear about actionable solutions, ways in which we can modify driver's behavior and mitigate risk through education, technology, and policy. I am also pleased that Jay Winston, Associate Dean for Health Communication, has joined today's discussion. It was through Harvard School of, uh, School of Public Health's Center for Health Communication, which Jay directs, that the designated driver campaign was launched in the US. And uh, that campaign has contributed to a decrease in fatalities of more than 25%. Now, Jay and the center are engaged in a similar fight for the public good through raising awareness about distracted driving. Last November, the center worked in collaboration with the Huffington Post in a very powerful series that shone a light on the dangers of distracted uh, driving. That work continues today. It is now my great pleasure to welcome to the podium Secretary Fox. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here, and I want to say to uh, those who, who are in this room, but also those who are watching, uh, we very much appreciate uh, the Harvard uh, School of Public Health uh, for inviting us here to talk about this very important uh, issue of distracted driving. And to Dean Frank and the entire team here, I want to thank you. I also want to um, acknowledge uh, Lance Gold and the Huffington Post for also making today possible and look forward to having some conversation with, um, uh, with Mr. Winston as well. Um, most of all, I want to thank everyone here. Uh, as we have gone through uh, the last four or five years of focus on distracted driving, it's increasingly become clear that uh, distracted driving is a, uh, a significant problem, a significant health risk. And I'll talk about some of the, uh, the impacts that we've already seen as a result of uh, individuals um, driving while distracted. There's also been progress and we continue to look for ways to enhance that progress over time and I'll spend some time talking about that as well. Um, but before I get into my remarks, um, I'd like you to hear from uh, some of the people who've been impacted by distracted driving. Uh, there are more people uh, in this country who've had um, 
events, uh, tragic events happen to them or uh, have actually uh, been uh, using a device and, and have been involved themselves. And why, why don't we just start with just uh, rolling the video about a distracted driving victim named Joe Teeter. Joe was uh, the youngest of three boys. He was 12 years old, seventh grade. He loved sports, he loved video games, he was very involved with this youth group, he loved Odyssey of the Mind. He was an actor and just a very fun, fun young man. Joe and I were on our way to an after school event that was only about a mile from our home. The vehicle that hit us passed six cars and a school bus that were stopped for the red light and she did not see them. She was on her cell phone and it was a classic inattention blindness case where she was talking and looking straight ahead and didn't see the cars passing in front of her and she hit our car and killed Joe. And we had never heard of distracted driving we had and um, we just were shocked why why aren't people screaming from the rooftops that this is dangerous every distracted driving incident could have been prevented parents don't understand when they hand their kids a cell phone they're handing them a lethal weapon and Thing, and we need to start acknowledging that. Just change the norms, change the thinking of everybody in this country, that it is not a safe practice, and everybody on the road owes it to everybody else on the road not to, not to be picking up their phone, not to talking, not texting. We need to make sure that kids are safe today. All it takes is putting down the phone. The saddest part of this video is, is that it's not the only one we've filmed. Uh, we've filmed dozens of them and unfortunately we're adding a new one this week which features a mother and a daughter I met earlier this month. The incident that occurred in their case was a situation in which uh, the mom was texting the daughter um, from home and uh, the daughter got into an accident trying to read her mom's text and it just shows you just how um, just how um, uh, deeply embedded this issue is in, in the lives of, uh, of so many real people and so uh, these videos are hard to watch especially as a parent but they also serve an important purpose which is to remind us of how critically um, challenging this issue is and basically this is our effort to help to shock Americans into reality about the dangers of texting uh, while uh, driving. At the Department of Transportation we know this all too well and the problem has been described as an epidemic and so it's fitting that we're here at the School of Public Health to host this discussion. This school was founded in 1913 when the world was suffering from a cholera epidemic that would claim about 800,000 lives. And a few years later, the Spanish flu would kill more, more people than World War I. So it's no wonder that the medical community stood up then and said, let's organize, let's bring more science to the fight, and let's figure out how to prevent and cure this sickness on a broad scale. In much the same way, about 100 years later, we are facing an epidemic of a different sort. Someone at DOT stood up and expressed the same sentiment. He wasn't a scientist, however. He was my predecessor, Ray LaHood. Uh, Ray LaHood turned dra distracted driving into a household word. And he sounded the alarm on this epidemic that we are continuing to fight today. In 2009, when Secretary LaHood and President Obama took office, it was hard for anyone to even imagine just how bad this crisis was. A Harvard study from 2003 estimated that distracted driving caused 330,000 accidents a year. But the numbers were hard to pin down and in most places police officers didn't even ask if drivers had been using their cell phones before a crash. 
And so it wasn't, it wasn't even the law back then uh, not to text while, while driving. And five years ago, you could have driven all the way from Canada to, from the Canadian border to Mexico, texting the entire way and not have broken a single law. Only 18 states had text, anti-texting regulations on the books back then. And I wouldn't say distracted driving was like a disease without a cure then, but it was a disease without a name, which is worse because you have to know what you're fighting to beat it. So that's what we did at USDOT starting under Secretary LaHood. We gave what, were, uh, what was a fighting, what we were fighting a name and a face and a voice and harness the full power of the federal government to beat it. We started ad campaigns. We worked with state legislatures. We worked with law enforcement and things began to change. And so today, just five years later, look at how much progress has been made. 43 states have passed bans on texting behind the wheel. South Dakota just passed theirs last month and 12 states ban all handheld phone use. Awareness is up. Distracted driving deaths are down, albeit slightly, and yet we are still running a marathon on this issue. It's not a sprint. For all the progress we made, we still need to make more because over 3,000 people died in distracted crashes in 2012, actually more like 3,300, which is the latest year we have data for. In addition to that, we can attribute distraction to about, about 421,000 cases of accidents across the country. Distracted driving is still a new field. It's still a new fight in many respects. And we're still learning how to combat it. And we don't have all the answers, but we're getting there. So I want to give you just a few updates on what we've learned recently and what we've done about what we've learned. We've always known, for example, that educating the public is an important way to keep drivers safe especially when that education is coupled with enforcement. But now we're uncovering data to back that up. Back in 2010, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, which we affectionately call NHTSA, created a pilot program called Phone in One Hand, Ticket in the Other. It would study the effects of increased law enforcement efforts and public service announcements. One city we looked at was Syracuse, New York, and the data showed there that because of high visibility law enforcement, both handheld phone use and texting behind the wheel declined by one third. Hartford was another city, and there was more room for improvement there than in Syracuse because Hartford drivers were talking on their cell phones twice as much. We're happy to report that handheld use has dropped by 57% and texting while driving has dropped nearly three quarters. As of this month, there was even more data because from November 2012 to June 2013, we ran pilot programs in California and Delaware. We invested $2.5 million in regions that altogether contained about 5 million people. And here's what we learned. By the end of the program, nearly 60% of California drivers were aware of the campaign, phone in one hand, ticket in the other. And at both sites, handheld phone use was dropped by a third. And so the bottom line is, is that data, the data showed that if we cracked down and spoke up at the same time, it worked. And so that's led us to this year's uh, Distracted Driving uh, Month, where we have um, initiated a, a public campaign, a massive national public campaign for the first time, where between uh, April 10th and the 15th, we actually had law enforcement ticketing drivers who were driving distracted, but we also launched a public relations campaign across the country called You Text, um, you, 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 text you Drive, You Pay. Sorry, I sometimes get You Pay in front of You Drive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and it drew on what we've learned in our pilot programs. Public service announcements and high visibility law enforcement are a winning duo. So that was lesson one. Here's another lesson. Young drivers are the biggest risks, and they are the most at risk. This may not sound surprising, but the scale of it is surprising. About a quarter of all teens responded to at least one text message every single time they drive. A quarter. 
And yet, the ironic thing is that young drivers, especially teens, are fast becoming our biggest allies in this fight. A few weeks ago, I went to an award ceremony in Washington, and high schoolers from all around the country had flown in, and there were hundreds of them, because they had all developed locally-based distracted driving efforts in their own towns. Today, friends are telling friends to put down their phones. Sisters are telling brothers, and yes, kids are even telling their parents not to text while driving. But communication on this issue is also happening somewhere else. It's between our offices at USDOT and the offices of American automakers. Three years ago, we announced that we were creating guidelines for how in-vehicle technology should be designed. How long, for example, it should take a driver to, ch to change the radio station. Our guidelines said your eyes shouldn't be off the road for more than two seconds at a time, or more than 12 seconds for any series of tasks. Recently, we've moved on to a second set of guidelines. In fact, we've just held two public meetings to talk about what we call nomadic devices, of which smartphones are the biggest example. And once those guidelines are complete, we'll focus on cognitive distraction to figure out ways to make things like in-vehicle voice-activated technology like OnStar an enhancement and not a distraction. So that is where I'll end my remarks except to say that I'm hopeful because we've been here before. It was in the 1970s almost 90 percent of Americans did not buckle up. Today nearly 90 percent do. Once drunk driving wasn't taken seriously and today its dangers are known and folks are much more likely to not drink and drive. Some folks say uh, people are going to drive how they want to drive and do what they want to do. You can't change human behavior. But again and again, we've proven that we can. And just as sure as we've proven that, we've proven that we can make progress in eradicating diseases. And so with that, I'm just pleased to be here with you. Uh, we're going to keep the fight up on seat belts. We're going to keep the fight up on drunk driving. But we're also going to keep the fight up on distracted driving. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Fox, for those remarks. Uh, we're going to split our conversation today to two parts. The first, we'll examine and explore the problem of distracted driving. And in the second half, we will look for some solutions. Uh, there will be an opportunity for questions after the conversation. Uh, just to reiterate some of uh, Se Secretary Fox's points, I wanted to point out how pervasive and destructive the problem is. I just want to drop a couple of quick stats. At any given daylight moment in the U.S., approximately 660,000 drivers are using electronic devices. There were 1.6 million automotive crashes last year attributed to cell phone use, and that's 25% of all crashes that took place. And as Secretary Fox just noted, uh, in 2012, more than 3,300 people were killed, and an astonishing 421,000 people were injured in crashes involving a distracted driver. So uh, first question, Secretary Fox, from a policy perspective, what are the most challenging aspects of this problem, policy-wise? Well, I think from a policy perspective, it's that there's so many different layers of government that have to be engaged in this issue. Um, as I said, 43 states have adopted anti-texting while driving laws. And uh, that's a very significant development. I'd like to see those other seven step up and do the same. Is there any pressure uh, being put on them by any central body or well, your office? We, are, we have done several things as an office to try to push, put some pressure on some of the states, including drafting sample legislation that can be readily adopted by those states. And we're going to keep putting the pressure on. But it's not just that. I think probably the biggest, the biggest challenge is the fact that in our culture, people think that everyone else shouldn't do it, but they can. And we've got to change the, 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 the discussion about this because it is a, so one of those things where if everyone stops doing it, we're going to be a lot safer. Do you have any thoughts on Yeah, just to extend, extend your point a little bit, in terms of social norms and expectations and what are the boundaries of acceptable behavior in our society. To me, that's the, that's the big challenge. <clears throat> you know, everyone, no one in here would, would dare take a cell phone call during this event. Uh, and we all double checked that we had the ringer off before we started because we'd be literally shamed and if we, if, our, if we had made an error and it had gone off, and everyone in the room would turn their heads to see who the offender was. 
But once we leave the room after this event, and we get into our car, and we drive away, and our cell phone rings, well, what do we do? Uh, in Massachusetts and in most other states, uh, it's still legal uh, for me to hold the phone and to have that conversation. Uh, I could at the same time, if I'm lucky enough to be driving a Tesla <coughs> Model S, I could be reading the Huffington Post on the Tesla's 17-inch touchscreen while I'm driving down the road. And then if the phone rings, uh, you know, what am I going to do? Um, it, for all I know, it's the Pope responding to the note I sent him, because <laughs> he does that. Uh, and so what the heck? There, it's true that there are going to be nine Americans killed today, on average, as a consequence of distracted driving, and there'll be 1,000 injuries. But what are the odds that I'm going to be the one in the next five miles to cause that? probably very, very low. So what the heck, I'd pick it up. And so there is no stigma. There is no social norm. There is no sense of shame. And the t to me, that's the number one challenge. And media will play a key role in this. <clears throat> but in terms of media, the big challenge is the sustainability of the effort. Uh, Mr. Secretary, the, the, uh, the, the, the impressive successes that you had with those model programs, to me, the biggest challenge is the sustainability of the efforts over time. You know, in New York State, they're very aggressive, uh, the state police are, and with these SUVs where the cops are actually peering down into the passenger compartment to see if someone is texting while driving. But that is a very labor-intensive effort. That's not a sustainable effort over time at a large scale. There may so, also be uh, uh, issues about primary infraction and, and secondary that infraction. That's true, yes. Do you, want uh, to address, do you want to address that? Well, many of the laws today, and these things take time. It's going to take two or three generations of laws, and it's not going to happen overnight. But in a whole bunch of jurisdictions, you get a slap with a $50 fine <laughs> for a misdemeanor of texting while driving, and you go on your way. So what message are we sending as a society when that's the penalty in terms of how seriously we view the problem, but that'll change over time. Uh, just moving mm -hmm. on to the next topic, Jay, can, can you offer any comparisons between the current problems posed by distracted driving and the issue of driving while impaired by alcohol? Yeah, well, you know, Harvard in the uh, late 80s and early 90s uh, introduced the designated driver concept into the American culture by collaborating with the Hollywood studios to depict the use of designated drivers and we, we had an advantage then. There were only three television networks when we started. There wasn't even a Fox. <laughs> they were only on two nights a week. Not this Fox. <laughs> oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> there was a year. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> uh, there was an internet, but no one had access to it. And there was cable, but they only had reruns. So if you had three friends, one of these broadcast network, and I did, you could hope to reach 75% of the American public on any given evening. <clears throat> and the challenge now, uh, with the fragmentation of the media marketplace and the extremely short attention span is how do we break through the noise in a sustainable way for a period of years in order to change social norms? That's the big challenge. Yeah, and I, I would add to that <coughs> that just as a parent, one of the things that we don't often take into account is the role modeling that we do. Right. But when a parent, even to a young child, is texting while driving, mm -hmm that sends a signal to that child that it's okay and that child grows up thinking that's a norm for driving and so there's a whole other level of this of just trying to reach into the younger generation and make sure they understand the seriousness of this. Because you mentioned the role of parenting uh, I think that would set up uh, the next clip that we have uh, mm -hmm. which, uh, which will address this issue and I won't say any more until you, until you, see, the, uh, the, until you see the video. It was unreal. I didn't believe it, you know, because I didn't. I knew, like I said, I have over the months and years before we talked about this cell phone use while driving. I didn't think, you know, she would do it. I've been telling kids they need to let's wait till they get where they're going before they answer text, talk on the phone. Let's put the cell phones away. The 
thing is, it's not only kids, it's adults too. I see a lot of adults on, on phones, you know, they, these kids see their parents using cell phones and they think it's okay, and it's not okay. You cannot text and drive at the same time. Um, Ashley is evident of that, that you cannot um, do both. Incredibly moving. Uh, Secretary Fox, you, you wrote a blog post uh, for the Huffington Post last year in which you uh, noted how important it was for parents to communicate with their children. You talked about your, uh, the relationship that you and your family have with your young, ch young children and uh, electronic devices. What is the role of parents and adults in modeling good and bad behavior around this issue? It's, it's vitally important um, for young people to understand what safe driving is and what it isn't. And when parents exhibit behaviors that are inconsistent with safe driving practices, it's just very, very difficult. The other thing is that I think parents have an outsized responsibility to also talk to their kids about technology and where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate, particularly when it comes to vehicles, because young people, um, frankly, they, they, they tend to pride themselves on being more tech savvy than the rest of us, and they probably are. But that doesn't mean that they know enough to be able to fight against the data. And the data tells us that when you text and drive, bad things happen. On that note, uh, what, what would you say is the role of social media in, in this problem? I, I would say that, uh, and, and I'll extend that question to ask, how, how do we define friendship nowadays? It seems there's a strong pull to communicate in short, bur short bursts and frequently, and teens are especially participating in this kind of communication. We live in a hyper-connected world, and um, we expect to be in constant contact with everybody at all times, and that's particularly true of young people, um, but it's also true of the rest of us. And the fact, the fact of the matter is that when you're in a vehicle and you're operating that vehicle, that is a time that does not, does not give itself to being connected. It's a time that you really need to spend focusing on the road, and that's just the message we have to just keep keep reinforcing. I'd say people don't realize, because we're so acclimated to cars and driving, that we're, we're each, as a driver, we're a licensed engineer sitting atop a two-ton machine that's barreling down a cement slab or blacktop at 60 miles an hour, uh, and it's dangerous. Uh, and there's, we need to find ways to communicate that in a, in a very vivid, gripping way. We also need to find ways, I think, to communicate. There's a, awareness of the problem is sky high, but it, my sense is it's a very casual, superficial level kind of awareness, and it's not a deep, penetrating awareness with a real understanding of the nature of the problem. And that somehow or other, we need to find ways to communicate the, the cognitive distraction side of it, that you can be, as we heard in that one video, staring straight ahead as the driver down the road, and the data that's incoming to you is not processed, and you're not reacting to it. You don't see it. You have, uh, you have cognitive distraction and situational blindness. And so th the fact that you're looking straight down the road and you look back from your 17-inch touch screen to the road doesn't mean that your attention is on the task of driving. And it's a pretty serious uh, task, which we don't tend to take seriously enough. It's not just young people involved, in, engaged in social media as well. So there's also uh, yeah. other folks as well, uh, besides, besides teens. And uh, the, the pull of the cell phone itself is so strong. Right. Can, can, you, can you address both the addictive quality of cell phones, maybe in light of, uh, in, in juxtaposed with the, uh, with the drunk driving campaign, and then also mm -hmm. uh, the ego that, that many of us have, including myself, about, about when you post something on social media, you want to see how many likes it gets and always checking. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you just address uh, just our role, uh, where, where, cell, where cell phones stand in, in, in our relationship to cell phones and, and what we need to do to curb that? Yeah, so, yeah, we're all drawn. I mean, a cell phone is like a magnet, and it draws our, draws our attention. And it has, addic using the term addiction loosely, it has addictive qualities to it. It's really hard to pass up the opportunity to check. If we've heard a noise that signals that we've just received a, a new text, there's, it's really hard not to reach for that. But part of what we need to do, I think, and, and I think media can play a crucial role in this, is there is no sense 
when you're driving down the road, you're noticing all the other drivers. And, you know, I, I noticed that parents who are driving their kids to play dates and fitness classes and the like, and, uh, gymnastics, um, they've got the phone to their ear constantly. And the question that we have to somehow find a way to confront is how much do we care that the driver coming at us from the opposite direction on the other side of that double yellow line uh, may be s deeply engaged in a phone call, looking straight ahead but seeing nothing, and then drifting across the line while they, while they uh, enter some information or look for a local restaurant on their touch screen to the right of their, their field of vision in the car. And, you know, we, we, we text and, and email and talk all day. At least we had the advantage with drunk driving. It's mostly when people go out on a Friday evening or a Saturday evening. It's not 24-7. And so it's such a part of our psyche and of our way of being that it's, we're going to have to reposition what it means when people see you um, talking on the phone. It's really showing that you're out of control, that you can't stop, that you can't put it down. And I almost think we want to recruit some top stand-up comedians, and we want videos on YouTube so that they're going to ridicule what it, um, the, the behavior of not being able to place your, put your phone, your phone down. And so, so over time, people, you'll have a sense when people are looking at you in the next car, they are seeing that you're out of control. Uh, and we need to kind of reposition that whole experience. Yeah, just to, just to add on to that point, one of the things we don't talk about a lot when it comes to driver's education uh, and what it takes to drive a car, and it gets back to something that, that you said, Jay, is that uh, when you're driving, you're not only responsible for your own safety, you're actually responsible for the safety of other people who aren't e even in your car, pedestrians, other drivers, et cetera. <coughs> And it's an incredibly selfish thing mm -hmm. to take your eyes off the road to look at a text message or to type something to someone because it but basically not only puts you in jeopardy, it puts everyone else on the road in jeopardy. I actually think long term that litigation is going to play a crucial role in terms of tort liability. That is personal responsibility and a corporate responsibility for creating, for knowingly creating a danger which resulted in the injury or death of another person. And that's going to contribute significantly to changing uh, ex the boundaries of acceptable behavior. Let me jump in and just uh, officially move to the second half of our conversation. We're going to start exploring <coughs> solutions to the problem here because it seems like we're starting to touch on that. And one solution is increasing public education. And the Department of Transportation has created distraction.gov which is the official U.S. government website for distracted driving, and also a corresponding PSA campaign. Let's look at another clip, the third clip, this one intended to reach and teach teens. How many letters? Five letters. Just think about what am I doing right now? Smile. <laughs> Smile? Uh-huh. This is so easy. <laughs> Nobody likes to be stopped by the police, but if I'd seen her texting while driving and given her a ticket, it just might have saved her life. Very powerful as well. Yeah. Jay, uh, you've touched on some of this a few minutes ago, but we, we've achieved tremendous awareness about the problem of distracted driving, and we, the numbers show that people are indeed very concerned about it, but their behavior has not changed. Mm -hmm. uh, those same numbers show that people concerned about it continue to engage in the practice. So. What is it going to take to break the back of this problem? Before I address that, I just want to say I think this is an extremely powerful ad that you put together. And I, I checked last night. It's been viewed on YouTube more than 2 million times. I know it's generated a tremendous amount of, uh, of press attention in local markets and nationally around the country. And it's an example of the kind of initiative that we, we need these kind of peaks of synchronicity of attention to the problem uh, repeated over time in order to generate the sustained effort that, that we're going to need. But I think that's, a, on a scale of 1 to 10, that, that ranks 11. I think it's, re it's really cool. Um, but in, in terms of, um, I think it's going to take a comprehensive strategy to finally break the back of this problem, that it's 
going to include uh, regula regulation, be it self-regulation by industry or government regulation. It's going to take uh, legislation, both the enactment of second and third generation laws and aggressive enforcement of them. It's going to take uh, litigation, as, as, as I mentioned. It's also going to take innovation, technological innovation, because technology is part of the source of the problem, but it's also part of the solution. I mean, they're working, for example, on uh, touch screens that will only be able to be viewed by the passenger. When you're sitting in the driver's seat, you will not be able to see the content. Uh, so there are solutions on the horizon, and I think uh, uh, technology will, will play a key role in that. Communication will be crucial, as we've been talking about, both at the level of driver education and at the uh, societal level of, of mass communication in an effort to change social uh, norms. Um, Mobilization will be key in terms of community grassroots mobilization, a la Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And then lastly, equally important to all the others, evaluation. That is, we need hard data on what, the, what is contributing to the risks and to what extent it's contributing to them. And then we need to be evaluating our solutions to make sure we're on track and we make mid-course corrections uh, if, if necessary. And in terms of these various components of a comprehensive strategy, Mr. Secretary, I think we ought to, next year in April, during this, uh, Distracted Driving Awareness Month, we ought to convene a summit to take stock at where we are in approaches to all seven of those elements and take a comprehensive look at the whole picture. Deal. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back. All right. Tune in, tune in next year. Uh, Looks like we're getting a, a, a sign for, for some Q&A time. And uh, the first question will be from our honored guest, Professor uh, Nicholas Ashford, director of the MIT Technology and Law Program. Professor Ashford? Well, you, know, you can't keep a cell phone out of a car, but you can keep a touch screen out of a car. Uh, we bailed out the automobile industry, and yet they are ferociously marketing, right? And we're letting them market the screens which are distractive. I have a couple of questions. First of all, not guidelines. We call it regulation, mandating. Do you have the courage, does this administration have the courage to ban these devices? Secondly, you say, well, you use GPS, but you actually don't need an audio, a, a visual signal for GPS. I never look at it. I always put it in, it says turn right, go straight, another mile. You don't have to have that kind of distraction. So it's, you know, I think there's a bigger problem here, which is the malaise of the society which says, all for me, me first, I have no social res responsibility, you have a libertarian streak that runs incredibly strong, do you and your department have the courage to do the right thing with because of this technology? Well, let me say a couple of things. Great question, by the way. Um, number one, uh, I have to applaud uh, not only NHTSA, but also former Secretary LaHood for really pushing this issue out into the forefront because it had been an invisible problem before. Uh, and we are learning things all the time that give us more information, more data that push us in different directions. That's part of the reason why uh, we developed um, you know, standards that, uh, of legislation that states could pass. It's part of the reason why we've been leading in research and working with the academic community to learn more about this problem. Um, in terms of the line between guidelines and, and rules. Uh, as a data-driven entity, we will always move towards what the data tells us. And uh, our guidelines that we've put out are ones that we always urge the auto industry to follow. And as data becomes more available and more prevalent and we learn more about this, um, I, I wouldn't put any brackets around where the department will go going forward. But right now, uh, we're encouraging the auto industry to follow our guidance. I just say something about the um, tort liability. I teach law at MIT. I can't understand how general counsel for any of these automobile companies can pass on allowing the screens to be in the car. Because unlike the cell phone, the, the liability is not very clear. Mm -hmm. But you put a distracted screen in front of a driver, and you are really letting yourself open for tort liability. Now, However, we remember from the Ford Pinto case that the industry basically did a calculation. They said, we'll pay much less money mm -hmm. out in tort suits than we will the advantages of, you know, the 
redesigning the car. So you need government to be stronger. I don't think you need the data. I think you're punting here. I think you need to take action and send a strong signal right now to ban this technology from being aggressively marketed. Response. One other point that I'll make on this is that uh, I've been a part of the rulemaking process for a while now. And um, the rulemaking process can sometimes drag on <laughs> long after new innovations come into the marketplace. And so part of what we are always balancing as an administration is, you know, what's going to be the fastest, most effective way to get to where I think both of us are. And right now, that's we are where we are. But again, that could change. Yeah. Can I just add on that? I was very, I shared your skepticism initially about guidelines. But the more I read about it, the more it became clear that any company that that, that violates or ignores uh, those guidelines will m render themselves highly vulnerable to a liability suit. So the industry actually is fighting like crazy against the particular terms of the guidelines because it does constrain what they want to do and they realize they're going to be hard pressed to violate them uh, from the point of view of the general counsel's office. Why don't we take a question from our online audience uh, next. Lisa, do we have any questions from online? Right. Yes, um, and we don't usually get this, but we have an online viewer who wants to ask our audience something. So <laughs> I'm going to do that one. It's real quick, and then I'll do <coughs> another question. I would like to see a show of hands of how many people in the audience use their cell phone while driving to this forum, and be honest. <laughs> Oh, not wow, very many. Zero. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> well, how many people are lying? <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> yeah. And um, here, the camera's we didn't have many. <laughs> Here's another question um, from Jean Hathaway. Could insurance companies be helpful partners to state and local efforts to address distracted driving? If so, can you provide any examples of such partnerships? Yes, the short answer is yes, and uh, we actually have a, an informal group of folks that come together to advise us on our distracted driving initiatives, and the insurance companies in, in some cases are at the table with us. Um, they have a vested interest in ensuring that the driving public is safe and that they're using best practices, and so it's a natural fit. So uh, this is an area where, uh, as we found at the federal level, uh, uh, there's no substitute for a governor or a mayor or someone who convenes and gets that conversation going on a, on a local or a state level and really driving the ball home. Yeah. Any thoughts and, on the insurance? Well, not on that, but kind of back for a moment on, on, the, on the auto industry. You know, I think it's important to underscore that the car companies care a lot about security, and their executives do, and they've done a tremendous amount to improve the security of vehicles. But when it comes to distracted driving, they have an inherent conflict of interest, and that's why the role of government is key as a counterforce to, to their inclination. Any other questions uh, from the audience? Right over here. Yeah, please uh, just identify yourself first. <coughs> Hello, Dave Swedler, a postdoc at Harvard School of Public Health. Um, as you said, we have th 43 states that have banned texting while driving and 12 that have banned handheld cell phone use. But the science has shown that there's really no difference between handheld cell phone use and hands-free cell phone use in crashes. Or if there is a difference, it's very negligible. Are we sending the implicit implication that it's OK to drive hands-free, despite the fact that there's no evidence that it is. It's a great question, and it's actually the subject of uh, the next phase of guidelines that NHTSA is working on right now. And uh, uh, that is going to engage not only the auto industry, but also the manufacturers of uh, cell phones and others. And uh, uh, you can bet uh, over the next several months it's going to be a, a, an interesting uh, uh, process to watch, but it is certainly one that we are aware of, and our guidelines will hopefully speak directly to that issue. Yep. Next question, over here. Hi, my name is Joanne McKinney and I work in the advertising industry. So my question actually points to the communication that you shared with us. Um, the disincentive that you're showing for distracted driving is actually the ticket in some instances, and although in the teen instance more obviously the thought of death. Um, 
how did you land on the ticket as being the real, I guess, leaping off point for discouragement of distracted driving versus perhaps some of the other issues that have been discussed here, whether it's the social aspect, caring for others on the road, caring for yourself, et cetera? Let me, let me sort of put the You Drive, You Text, You Pay initiative in context. Um, over the last five years, there have been a number of steps that we've taken. And while we think it's an important step based on the data we've seen to have a public relations campaign coupled with strong law enforcement, as I talked about in Syracuse and uh, also in Hartford, um, as well as California and Delaware, those are really critical components to have working together. But it's not the only effort we're undertaking. I mean, honestly, I think this issue comes down to, uh, if you look at seat belts back in the 70s and 80s, um, it took a while before it became commonplace for people to buckle up. And it's a culture, it's a behavioral uh, change that we're having to get the American public used to. And this is, it, it's going to take a while. Um, but part of it is being consistent. It's, it's part of it is having law enforcement at the table. And part of it is c continuing to advocate for the kind of behavior that we know we need to have. It's not just one thing. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, in, the in the back row. Hi, uh, my name is Brad Benton. I work here at HSPH. Uh, I know you've mentioned that 43 states have passed laws, but with the federal transportation authorization expiring at the end of FY14, does that give Congress the power or create a window for federal legislation to address this, you know, tied to funding mechanisms? Or, or is it just going to be, you know, a bunch more patchwork extensions? Yeah, in, in the past, um, the way Congress has effectively uh, uh, encourage states to act is by holding uh, some of their highway trust fund dollars um, at, at stake if they don't uh, comply. Uh, that's how uh, a lot of the seatbelt laws got done back in the day. And so I think there's an opportunity for Congress if, they, if it's so uh, moved to, to deal with that. Um, but let me also say this, that um, from our vantage point, um, we're going to continue doing everything we can as a department to, to learn as much as we can about this to inform the public, to push for passage of laws, whether it's at the state level, local level, or even at the federal level where appropriate. And, and that's just, you know, that, this is an effort that is not going to stop with Secretary LaHood. It's not even going to stop with Secretary Fox. It's something that's going to continue going because it's going to take a long time for us to get where we want to be from a culture perspective. Just to reiterate a question I asked you earlier. Sure. Um, what, what sort of pressure is being put on the states that are not complying, uh, the, the seven states? And they seem to be in somewhat the sa same geographic area, I believe it was uh, in, 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 the, in the south and southwest. So I, I think some of the, the pressure that's being put on them, first of all, we've, again, dra drafted model laws. Uh, we know where those states are, and when we go there, we talk about this, particularly with our uh, Federal Highway Administrator and the NHTSA Administrator as well. But even more importantly, those states also have victims. And uh, what we find a lot is that the victims are some of the most, most persuasive um, voices in this entire conversation. And, and that's why I think we now have 43 states as opposed to 42 or 41, is because victims are speaking up. And it takes a lot of courage. And I do want to say how much we appreciate those victims who come out publicly to talk about this. Uh, in the back. Hi, Veronica Thomas, a student here. Um, and I'm just wondering what role you think that cell phone manufacturers have in making the behavior to refrain from texting while driving or using a cell phone while driving more habitual. So an app that shuts off or uh, a car mode, like we have airplane mode. What, what can the um, cell phone manufacturers do? Something that may be preloaded on the cell phone when you buy it. There's an awful lot the manufacturers could do, and uh, I know there's ongoing work with some of the manufacturers to look at ways to limit the use of a cell phone in a vehicle, um, and I think that work should, should happen. Uh, again, as our guidelines are put together and put out for public uh, consumption, uh, we'll have more specifics on the department's position, but uh, we're encouraged to see the manufacturers dialing into this issue and trying to get ahead of us. 
We have another question from our online uh, audience. Right, and I know we're getting short on time. We do have a lot of questions online, so I'll just do this one. Can the DOT or state DOTs implement more signage and red stops pull-offs for texting breaks? My home state of New York has strong regulations about talking, texting while driving, and you see people pull over on the throughway to talk text. Why haven't other states implemented this? It's a great idea, and it's something that uh, that's a place where we can uh, potentially play a role. Um, we develop model standards for the development of road networks, for example, and that's a very good point, and I'll take it back to our folks at the Federal Highway Administration to see what we can do on it. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for uh, one more question. I think that we um, do, if I could actually take this from online again, sure. just to include folks. This is an interesting idea. Any thoughts of enlisting places like McDonald's and other fast food restaurants where young people stand in line every day as a place to show distraction.gov's PSAs? It would take a business like McDonald's to embrace the cause and do something about it. This is from our live chat. Uh, it's a very good, uh, very good idea. Another one that we'll take back. Uh, we, in a, as an administration, we have to make sure we're being consistent with the First Lady's Let's Move <laughs> initiative. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, Thank you. Our, our forum has come to an end, but you can continue the conversation at www.forumhsph.org or on Twitter at, at forumhsph. The next forum will be on May 21st about the risks and rewards of delaying parenthood. Thanks for joining us today. This video will be made available on YouTube and iTunes U.